My daughter Leah was incredible. She was the life of our family. As I look back, she was not on any monitors. This was so avoidable. Had she been on a monitor, um, they would have detected that her breathing was deteriorating. And monitoring is, is so easy nowadays. I mean, the, the new technology is so simple, you know, and inexpensive and not invasive. And to find somebody dead in bed is inexcusable. I knew I couldn't live my life and not do something. I've made the goal of continuous post-operative monitoring my commitment. All that stands between us in universal post-op monitoring is the will to require it. In my opinion, all patients should be monitored. So I know it's complicated. I'm sure it is far more complicated than I understand. But anesthesia has tackled tough problems before. We need to move forward on this in the most expeditious way possible. The Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation believes that clinically significant opioid-induced ventilatory impairment in the post-operative period is a serious yet often preventable patient safety risk. Thus, APSF is advocating a paradigm shift in how clinicians and nurses care for patients receiving post-operative opioids, most often for pain management. This paradigm shift is based on the belief that continuous electronic monitoring of oxygenation and ventilation, when combined with traditional intermittent nursing assessment and vigilance, will greatly decrease the likelihood of unrecognized, life-threatening, opioid-induced ventilatory impairment. APSF believes that continuous monitoring offers the opportunity for prompt and predictable improvement in patient safety. In September 2011, the Anesthesia Patient Safety Foundation sponsored a multidisciplinary conference to address the topic. The speakers and attendees were asked to address two basic questions. One, should electronic monitoring be utilized to facilitate detection of postoperative opioid-induced ventilatory impairment? And two, if yes to electronic monitoring, who should be monitored, inclusive or selective? and what monitors and or technology should be utilized. The following excerpts from the conference presentations, as well as input from attendees, served as the basis for the recommendations and conclusions that evolved from this conference. It begins with vital signs. Traditionally, the vital signs were the ones we see here, the traditional four. Who should be monitored electronically? I would say, any inpatient, but certainly any inpatient prescribed narcotics, because if they're prescribed, they can be received. There are two purposes to monitoring. You need to absolutely are required to have continuous monitoring system if it's your goal to prevent every possible death. Who should be monitored? Everyone. I think pulse ox at a minimum uh, is required. I think the barrier, um, the technology is not perfect, I agree. Um, but the barrier, I think, is not the technology. It is the will to have, um, to reduce to zero um, the number of adverse events and the will to spend the money to do it. The potential value of continuous pulse oximetry monitoring linked to a patient surveillance system has been addressed by Tanzer and colleagues. His report is the first step in introducing continual physiologic monitoring to a traditional general hospital floor. The cost effectiveness of continuous electronic monitoring depends on the impact of patient surveillance. When patient surveillance is associated with a decreased ICU transfer rate, the implementation and ongoing maintenance costs of the system are more than offset, and the return on investment is positive. No matter where you set the threshold, I think that we get too many false negatives and false positives. We either get this sense of security that everything's all right, when in fact it may not be, or we have these alarms that are going off that eventually our caregivers get desensitized to. I would agree with the notion of continuous monitoring. I don't see the value in intermittent monitoring. Um, I, I really stop short of talking about high-risk patients because while we can define them in a category, we're going to get burned uh, when, we, when we try to 
sort of differentiate because you don't always know who's a high risk patient who's not. So I think appropriate patients probably means all patients, certainly all patients who are receiving opioids and sedatives. You know, one of the questions that's been asked, you know, boy, this is going to cost a lot, in it, isn't it? And I, I say, well, gosh, can we not afford to do this? APSF has the following recommendations and conclusions with respect to non-ambulatory adult patients receiving parenteral opioids for the management of acute post-operative pain while being cared for in a healthcare facility. All patients should have oxygenation monitored by continuous pulse oximetry. Capnography or other monitoring modalities that measure the adequacy of ventilation and or airflow is indicated when supplemental oxygen is needed to maintain acceptable oxygen saturations. Risk stratification is not acceptable. Monitor all patients receiving opioids. Continuous electronic monitoring should complement and not replace traditional intermittent nursing assessment and vigilance. The complete report of the Monitoring Strategies Conference is available in the Fall 2011 issue of the APSF Newsletter. I've made the goal of continuous post-operative monitoring my commitment. All that stands between us in universal post-op monitoring is the will to require it. <laughs>